Bullshit Jobs A Theory by David Graeber The provisional definition of a bullshit job is a form of employment that is so completely pointless, unnecessary or pernicious that even the employee cannot justify its existence. Some jobs are just so pointless that no one even notices if the person who has the job vanishes. This book suggests that if you're serving the top 1% who have riches and power, such as a corporate lawyer, you have a bullshit job. These jobs have increased in number with professional, managerial, clerical sales and service workers having tripled, growing from one quarter to three quarters of total employment. You tend to know if you have a bullshit job, the purpose is really not significant. Note. A bullshit job in this book would differ from a shit job, which is necessary, just not very good and often underpaid. People in the service industry from the book's perspective don't have bullshit jobs, unlike a professor of anthropology who does have a bullshit job and the author confesses to being one of these himself. An example of a bullshit job is an interlibrary loan office in the University of Chicago Science Library in which at least 90% of the people, what they did was just photocopying journal articles and mailing them out. And they'd have various medical titles such as the Journal of Cell Biology, Clinical Endocrinology, the American Journal of Internal Medicine. Interestingly, a new employee came there and thought this was helping doctors, but to the contrary, the bemused co-workers did explain that actually it's helpful to sue a doctor for malpractice, because part of the show involves displaying lots and lots of different journals, and in the off chance that a defence attorney does look at it, it has to appear vaguely relevant. So... This is an example of a bullshit job. Business owners often don't think that there are a proliferation of bullshit CEO jobs. And that's really because a CEO job is not bullshit because it has an impact for better or for worse. CEOs are just often oblivious to all the bullshit that they create. So, a situation has sparked in which there's a proliferation of social media and basically all of these lend people to consume them whilst undertaking and pretending to do a bullshit job. If we look back to the medieval ages, a medieval swordsmith for example or a soap maker, nobody would tell them after they have trained how to do this correctly. This is very much unlike today because with industrial capitalism it changed all that and there was a rise of managerialism in the 20th century that drove this process even further and rather than in any sense reversing um, under the financial financialized capitalism this situation has actually worsened efficiency has come to mean Invest in more and more power to managers, supervisors, and other presumed efficiency experts. So the actual producers have almost zero autonomy. At the same time, the ranks and orders of managers seem to reproduce themselves endlessly. And where once universities, corporations, movie studios, and the like had been governed by a combination of relatively simple chains of command and informal networks, we've now a world of funding proposals, strategic vision documents and developmental team pitches. These allow for endless elaborations of newer and ever more pointless levels of managerial hierarchy, staffed by men and women with elaborate titles who are fluent in corporate jargon, but who either have no first-hand experience of what it's like to actually do the job that they're supposed to be managing, so they've often never had that experience. Questions of values are 
questions of value are always a little at least murky. See, Marxist theory would suggest the terms productive and unproductive labour, by which he meant that labour is either productive or unproductive for capitalists. Productive labour yield some kind of surplus value that capitalists can extract profits, profits from. Other label, labour is at best reproductive, that is such as housework or education. They're always put forward as primary examples, but really these tasks are necessary, second order work, to keep workers alive and raise new generations of workers, so that they in future can in turn do real work of being exploited. At the very top of organisations, apparently crucial positions can go unfilled for long periods of time without there being any noticeable effect, even on the organisation that they're in. And this is the reason why if you look to the financial sector, they very seldom go and strike extremely well-paid people. In the 1970s, in Ireland, the bankers had a six-month strike, and what they thought would occur is that the economy would grind to a halt, but instead people just started circulating cheques as a form of currency, and everything carried on as much before. Whereas two years before, the garbage collectors in New York went on a strike for a mere ten days, and with that, the city caved to their demands. There's a 2017 paper by U.S. economists Benjamin B. Lockwood, Charles G. Nathanson, and E. Glenn Weil, and this combed through existing literature on the externalities, the social costs, and the spillover effects, social benefits associated with various highly paid professions, to see if it's possible to calculate how much each adds to or subtracts from the economy overall. The conclusion was interesting. The most socially valuable workers who contributed could, were medical researchers. They'd often add $9 of overall value for every $1 paid. The least valuable were those who worked in the financial sector, and on average, they actually took away $1.80 from every $1 they obtained in compensation. The general principle that the more work one benefits others, sadly, the less you tend to get paid. The book generally mentions doctors as an exception to the rule, who tend to get well paid and provide benefits to others, so therefore they don't have bullshit jobs. However, it's not as clear as that. It did mention a pharmacist who provided their opinion that was basically their own job and doctor's jobs are pointless because they just prescribe placebos. So the, one of the central themes for this book is that, in general, if you choose to benefit society, especially if you have the gratification of knowing that you're benefiting society, then you really have no business of expecting a middle-class salary, paid vacations or generous retirement packages. By the same token, there's also a feeling that if you have to suffer with the knowledge that you're doing pointless or even harmful work, then you need to be rewarded with more money for that exact reason. The key to care in labour as a commodity is not the same people who care that others don't. Those, let me explain that for a bit, those who are paying for services feel no need to engage in this labour themselves. So if you had a bricklayer, for example, the bricklayer, if they're working for somebody else, they have to constantly monitor what their boss is thinking, whereas their boss doesn't have to care. And the author of the book suggests that's why psychological studies often show that people of working class backgrounds are actually more accurate at reading other people's feelings and more empathetic and caring than those of middle class, let alone wealthy backgrounds. One cannot save to ensure a college education for one's children unless one is sure that in 20 years there'll still be colleges or, for that matter, still money. 
so you can see why this cycle is hard to break. Over the course of the 20th century, work came to be increasingly valued primarily as a form of discipline and self-sacrifice. We kept inventing jobs because of this false idea that everybody has to be employed in some sort of drudgery because according to Malthasian Darwinian theory, he must justify his right to exist. In other words, they gain feelings of dignity and self-worth because they hate their jobs. This attitude seems to have just remained, and it's in the air all around us, and it's implicit in office small talk, the pressure to value ourselves and others on the basis of how hard we work at something we'd rather not be doing. And if you're not destroying your mind and your body via paid book work, then you're not living right. This attitude is more common amongst middle-class office workers than amongst migrant farm workers or parking lot attendants. But even the more working-class environments, the attitude can be observed through its negation, since even those who do not feel they have to validate their, dis their existence on a day-to-day -day basis by boasting about how overworked they are, they are, we nonetheless agree, that those who avoid work entirely should probably drop dead. Unconditional universal support could actually function well. Most people would prefer not to spend their days sitting around watching TV, and the handful who are really inclined to be total parasites and aim to be a significant burden on society would actually be outweighed by the people who are required to maintain and work more than their fair share. The first objection raised when somebody tries to guarantee that everybody has a livelihood is simply false. It's simply that the people wouldn't work. This is untrue. But the second, more serious objection is in fact that the people would do work that is of more interest to themselves. The streets would fill with bad poets, annoying street mimes, and promoters of crank scientific theories, and nothing would get done. What the phenomenon of bullshit jobs really brings home is the foolishness of such assumptions. No doubt a certain proportion of the population of a free society would spend their lives on projects that most others would consider are silly or pointless, but it's hard to imagine how that would be over 10 or perhaps 20%. This compares to now, when roughly 40% of workers in rich countries already feel that their jobs are pointless. Roughly half the economy consists of or exists in support of bullshit, and it's not even particularly interest in bullshit. If we let everyone decide themselves how they would best fit into humanity with no restrictions at all, how could they possibly end up with a distribution of labour as inefficient as we already had have. And that's the powerful argument for human freedom. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Feel free to comment below, like, subscribe, and I shall see you next time.